Search for the Airlink TV app. Download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. flavored water water but better I'm a cool kid you're a cool kid we are cool kids are you a cool kid by visiting www.fruitycoolkids.com. Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome to see results on IBN TV. Um, thank you for joining us on IBN China, channel 8 or channel 108, depending on your cable provider, as well as on our Facebook pages, the see results Facebook page and the IBN TV Facebook page. All right, so today is the Thursday, our final class for this week, and I just want to remind everybody that we have assignments and quizzes due tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. Those quizzes were posted on Saturday morning. Uh, we have three currently up, English, Math, and a creative writing submission that you have to do. All right, so if you haven't done it as yet, remember to do so after the show tonight or after you get home from school tomorrow. All right, we have uh, quite a large number of students who have already done it, but you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to, of course, have your name featured um, as we, you know, we share with you the top performers every week on a Monday, all right? So if you haven't yet joined us, just to remind you, um, before we get into our work today, you visit edmodo.com or you download the Edmodo app and you can register your child parents using the code 6KJQ3Y, all right? So just to repeat, the code is 6KJQ3Y, and if you're watching us on Facebook right now, there's, of course, a direct link to our page on the um, About section of our Facebook page for series results as well, all right? So those are your options to get in. And, of course, my name is uh, Sir Ijaz Ramsahai, and I will be taking you through the mathematics today, as I do every Monday and Thursday, all right? So... We are in the strand currently of statistics on the, our last program, which was on Monday. We looked at the frequency tables and the tally charts, and we also had time to look at pictographs, all right? Those are both methods of representing statistical data, right? Data information that is gathered about various things, all right? It's something that has a very practical use. Um, in life, in research, and so on, and it's it, it's done uh, and across all sectors of society, 
to understand how things are working and functioning and to convey that information to various users, right? Various consumers. So that's what the SEA is all about. Your first step in ensuring that you understand how to function in our society, all right? And mathematics, English, your ability to write and so on helps in your development. It's not only about getting the passes to the schools that you desire, which of course we, we aim to help you to do, right? We make um, no apologies for that, of course. That is our main objective. But of course, you have to understand that it's not just about writing an exam. It's also about gaining the skills for you to function as a, a member of our society, all right? So the statistics strand of the mathematics paper, it features only seven questions out of 45 questions, and those 45 questions must be completed in 75 minutes. The paper has three sections, all right? This is just a quick recap for our first time viewers today. A lot of parents find this information very beneficial because it helps them to help prepare their child for their exam, all right? So we are on the statistics and we are dealing with the topic currently of bar graphs. Now this is a method that we haven't looked at as yet and we're going to delve into bar graphs a little bit uh, before we move on to our next segment on the program today when we'll be coming back around to the first stream, the most, the most uh, numerous stream in terms of questions, which is number, all right? So in the bar graphs, what is a bar graph? So a bar graph is basically another method of representing data, all right? Previously, we've looked at the frequency table, the tally chart, as well as the pictograph, which uses pictures or symbols. But for the bar graph, you know, we tend to see bars, you know, used instead of pictures and symbols. And one distinctive feature of the bar chart is that all the bars have to be the same width, right? And the heights would vary um, to represent the particular value, all right? So the, the bars must be the same width. So that's something that you need to bear in mind when you're drawing your bar graph. It's a very common mistake to see children drawing a bar graph and one, one bar is very wide and the other one is skinny and so on. You know, you have to try your best. Of course, um, you may not get it down to the exact millimeter of width, but you know, try to represent it as evenly as possible. All right, and another distinctive feature is that the space between all the bars must be the same, all right? So these are just two tips that I want to leave with you, and I want you to bear that in mind when you're drawing your bar graphs, the bars on the bar graph must be the same width and they must be the same distance apart, all right? The same space between. And of course, the bars can be horizontal as well as vertical, all right? So I immediately would like to open up my lines to you students out there because we have about three bar graph questions that I want to look at and those numbers will be put up on the screen. So you all feel free to give us a call and let's work these problems out together, all right? So our numbers are up and do call us as we attempt to answer and to analyze these questions, all right? So our first question, right? And you'll find that in a lot of statistical questions, it will be presented as the results of some survey that was done, all right? So maybe your big brother or your big sister or cousin or so on, they might be doing their SBAs and stuff for school and they come home with this paper and they're asking mommy, daddy, the neighbors, everybody, maybe even you, questions and noting down the responses. That is a survey or a questionnaire that they're doing. All right, that's how we gather information. It's one way. Of course, now there are many, uh, there are many other ways. All right, but that is one such way. So a survey was done to determine the favorite subject of 40 students. All right, so let's have a little close up of our um, question here. Right, 40 students and these are the numbers that were collected, right? Math, art, science, PE, and grammar are the subjects that they could have selected, all right? And we want to find out how many students' favorite subject was PE. So I have a caller on the line, and I'm going to take this call. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hold on. Hi, good, good evening. OK. So we seem to have lost that caller. And just a reminder to all of our callers, um, 
please turn the volume down on your TV sets when you're calling, all right, and listening on the phone so that we don't have any feedback, all right? So we have math, art, science, PE, and grammar. What is the size of the class? 40 students, all right? So much like in our frequency table, tally chart questions, we were given information. We were told that this is the size of the population. Remember, I used that word last time to describe um, the, the, the group that we have, we've collected this information or this data from. And sometimes we have a missing value. What do we do to find out that missing value? I have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hello. Hi, good evening. And who am I speaking with? Micah George. Hi, uh, welcome, Micah George, a very active participant on our Ed Modo. Micah, have you done your assignments already for this week? Yes. All right, excellent. So, Micah, we have a class with 40 students, and these are the students, the subject, sorry, that they have picked to be their favorite. Can you help me figure out how many students chose PE as their favorite subject? We have to add up or math, art, science, and grammar, right. and you'll get 33, mm -hmm. and then 40 subtract 33 is 7. It's 7, all right. And how did you know? How, to, how many students like each of those subjects, Ma uh, Micah? Because the line does, when it, like the line does tell you the oh. number. Right, so for math, we see in here that eight students like math because we're reading it off on this vertical line here on this side, right? Mm-hmm. Right, and 12 liked art, um, three liked science because it's between our two and our four, right? And, and, ten. and 10 like grammar. So you added those up and you got 33, subtracted it, and, and 7 was your answer, yes? Yes. All right, Micah, excellent work. Thank you so much for your call. All right, so viewers at home, let's just recap. This is a bar chart, all right? If you didn't know, well, and you're seeing it for the first time, let's just, um, we, have, we have some standard four students with us. Perhaps they haven't done so much work in statistics as yet. Maybe they have, but it's beneficial to just be reminded, all right? We have our subjects here along the horizontal line, okay? And we have our five subjects represented. We have math, we have art, we have science, PE, and we have grammar. Here now on our, on our vertical line, right? We have a scale here where each increment is going up in multiples of two, all right? So it's going up by two each time we move up one notch on our vertical scale, all right? So we look at the subject below. This bar here represents the subject of math. So we read off the value from the vertical line, which is an eight, all right? That's how we know that eight people preferred math, we do the same thing for art, and we'll end up with the 12. All right, we are reading off our 12 value here. So we have 12, we do the same for science. Now science is a bit different because it falls between our increment here, all right? So we'll going to assume it's directly in the middle and, said, and call that Three, three students, and then we have grammar, all right? We have grammar, which is aligned to the 10 value, all right? So we know that 10 people prefer grammar as their favorite subject, all right? How many students do we have in our class? We have 40 students in our class, all right? And we have one subject missing, which is PE. All right, if we add those four numbers up there, 12 added to 8 gives us 20, added to 3 is 23, and we add 10, we get 33, all right? And to know our missing value, we simply subtract, as Micah said, and we're going to end up with 7, all right? So important point to note now, when drawing this, of course, you will be aided by your ruler, all right? You're going to make sure and have an equal spacing between science and PE and PE and grammar, all right? And we're going to have to draw this bar up to seven, all right? Up to seven. And 
that would fall between 6 and 8, all right? In our six line and the eight. All right, try to make it as near as possible to the thickness, of course, using your ruler. And then you basically have to color in this bar, and that would be your answer. All right, that would be your answer for this question. So that's basically how we work with bar graphs viewers, all right? So let's move on to our next question. And this question tests our knowledge of um, frequency, okay, how so? The bar graph shows the number of cups of juice drank by four children at a party, all right? So four of our viewers, Tyreek, Angelina, Destiny, and Aditya, bomb stop at this. C results party, and this bar graph tells us how many cups of juice they drank while at this party, all right? So the question would like to ask, which child represents the mood? And I have a caller on the line already. Good evening, caller. Welcome to C results on IBN TV. Okay. Uh, so hi. hi, good evening. Who am I speaking with? Good morning. Is the child that drank the most amount of juice. Right. And which child is that? Aditya. Right, Aditya. And how many cups of juice did Aditya drink? Seven cups. All right. And looking at our scale here on the vertical line now, right? Each one is going up by how much? Each, each, each line. Cup? Each increment on our vertical line here. How much is it increasing by as we go up as we go up the scale? One. One. Excellent. As opposed to our last question where it was going up by two. All right. So you have to pay attention to that. Don't just assume that it will be one or two or five or whatever. You need to pay careful attention and read it off properly. All right. And okay. Um, okay. So the answer is um, Aditya, as you've said. And who am I speaking with, by the way? All right, so that caller preferred not to be identified, but the answer given was correct nonetheless. All right, what is our mood? Our mood is that thing, that value, that item that has the highest frequency or that occurs the most. All right, so the person that drank the most cups of juice is clearly at the tier for this question, all right, who drank a total of seven cups of juice. Then we had Angelina drinking six and Tyreek and Destiny both drank four cups of juice. So again, the mode is the one with the highest frequency, the thing that occurs the most, or in this case, Aditya represented the mode by drinking the most number of cups of juice. All right. So thank you, Kola. You are very correct. And we have one more bar chart question here all right the number of cups of water drunk by mrs porter in a five-day period is shown in the bar graph below all right so this is the same person that we are looking at over a period of time the number of cups of water they drank for a week and the question asks on which day did she drink a total of 21 cups of water on which days sorry did she drink a total of 21 cups of water I have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Good evening, caller. Hi. Hi, and who am I speaking with this evening? Cara. Welcome, Cara. Cara, Hi. can you tell me on which three days Mrs. Porter drank a total of 21 cups of, of water? Um. All right. So it's a bit out to take in and to answer, so I'll, I'll help you out and you'll help me, right? Okay. How many cups of water did Mrs. Porter drink on Monday? On Monday, she drank five. Five, right? How did you know it's five? Because it's between four and six. Right, very good. All right, and what about on Tuesday? 
nine. Good. On Wednesday. Twelve. Twelve. And what about Thursday? Six. And finally, we have Friday, right? How many yes. cups of water on Friday? Seven. Seven, all right? Okay. So, which three of those days added together will give us a total of 21, Cara? I'm adding it just now. All right. Let's take a second. All right, so this is a case here where you have to look and find a combination of three numbers there when added together that will give us our total of 21 cups. Cara, I, are you sitting next to a fan by chance? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll get a lot of noise from the fan. I'll take it off. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it is on Yes, go ahead. All right, so you want me to tell you the answer? Yes. All right, so on Monday and Tuesday, how much is nine and added to five? Huh? How much is nine added to five, Cara? Fourteen. All right, and 14 plus seven gives us how much? Twenty-one. Twenty-one, right? So on what three days did Mrs. Porter drink a total of 21 cups of water? Everything by mistake. All right. On Monday. Yeah. Monday. Friday. Friday. And Tuesday. All right. So Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your patience and for working with us. Very well done. You're welcome. All right. So that was Cara there. And yes, these questions can be a bit, you know, of a brain teaser. All right? You have to juggle those three, those five numbers and find the correct combination to give you an answer of 21. Of course, it might be a bit more challenging to do by looking at your tablet or phone and on TV while being on live television and working that out. So we welcome that. And she had the right approach, of course. All right? So well done, Cara. Thank you so much for your input into our program. All right, so that brings us to the end of our most recent journey into the strand of statistics. All right, parents, the, the exam is made up of questions from four different strands of mathematics. We have number, we have measurement, we have geometry, and we have statistics. We've made the rounds of all four of those about three times already, um, well, by now I should say, and we're gonna continue in that manner and cover as many topics as we can before your SEA exam, which is carded for the 2nd of April of 2020. All right, so the time is fast, you know, arriving. So we have to continue to strive to get through as many questions as possible. All right, so number is the biggest um, strand of math in our paper. It accounts for almost, or well, just about, half of our 45 questions, all right? 10 in sections one and two as well as two in section three. All right, each section, the question, questions tend to get a bit harder and they tend to be worth more marks, all right? So we're on, well, a lot of people have difficulty with this topic of fractions and there's a lot of work that you need to cover for SEA in the area of fractions from the very basic all the way up to some quite challenging questions, all right? So we're going to dedicate the rest of today's program and probably also Monday's program to fractions. And hopefully we might get to revisit it again before um, the end of this season, before our students go off to write their SEA exam. Of course, we hope to continue with our standard four students 
but we're trying to really help our standard five students right now, all right? So what is a fraction? A fraction represents part of a whole, all right? It's part of a whole. That is what a fraction of something is, all right? So when something is broken up into a number of equal parts, all right, so as opposed to unequal sharing, all right, that is also a topic that gives a lot of students trouble. We're dealing with fractions right now. So these, these holes are broken up into equal parts, all right? The fraction shows how many of those parts we have, all right? And we're going to see what exactly we mean by that as we delve in to our slides, all right? So here we have a pizza, all right? And this pizza is comprised of eight slices, all right? So somebody's already trying to have this slice that is highlighted here, all right? How many slices of pizza make up this entire pizza or this whole pizza. It, it has been broken up into eight equal parts, all right? And if I were to take one slice of that pizza, I would have a fraction of the pizza in my hand or on my plate ready to consume, all right? So I would have one over eight, all right? Or one eighth of the pizza, all right? So if I took for example, another slice of pizza, that would change from one eighth to two eighths, and so on, right? So if I had taken this additional slice of pizza here, and I highlight this one as well, all right, I will now have two eighths of the pizza in my possession, all right? And if I took another slice of pizza, how many would I have now? I would, of course, have three slices of pizza, but that pizza is broken up into eight equal parts so that the fraction of the pizza that I would now have is actually three-eighths of that pizza, okay? So that is what we mean by a fraction being part of a whole, all right? So if I were to eat now all of these three slices of pizza, all right, I would be left with how many slices of pizza? How many slices of pizza would we have remaining? It would be one, two, three, four, five slices of pizza, and how would I represent that as a fraction? I would be left with five over eight, or five eighths of the pizza, all right? And of course, all the parts in our fraction, right? All the parts of our fraction, when added up together, is going to give us one whole. All right, so that's what we mean by fractions being a part of a whole, right? And they are made up of equal parts, all right? So this is an example of pizza that we had here, broken up into eight slices or cut into eight slices, eight equal slices, and each slice of that pizza represents one over eight or one eighth of the pizza, all right? So hopefully, so far, so good. And just a point to note, all right? This is called our numerator, right? The number above that line, all right? Which has a fancy name, the vinculum, all right? And this here is the denominator, all right? Just for ease of understanding, I'll just call this the fraction line, right? So this represents how many pieces the whole is broken up into, which is eight, and this represents the number of pieces that I am currently looking at, all right, or the amount that I currently possess or I am using or whatever or, or, or that I am left with after using a certain portion of that whole, all right, or a certain fraction of that whole. We have the numerator on top and we have the denominator below, 
all right, separated by that horizontal line. So, right, I hope that that pizza example didn't make you too hungry, all right, because, of course, we are, we are going to be taking your calls and we don't want your um, hand to be too greasy when you're calling, right? Don't greasy up mom and dad's cell phone or the home phone, all right? So, for the rest of today, we're going to be looking at proper fractions. All right, so remember I just told you about the numerator and the denominator. The numerator being the number on top and the denominator being the number below. All right, so a proper fraction is one where the numerator is smaller than the denominator. All right, you might be wondering, well, why am I telling you this? Because we have improper fractions and mixed numbers, which is something that we'll, we'll have to look at as well in the future. All right, so in our example just now, this is three slices out of the eight in the pizza. This is called a proper fraction because three is smaller than eight, all right? The numerator is smaller than our denominator. If I had a fraction like this, all right, this would be called an improper fraction but I don't want to confuse you all right now. So just learn, understand that a proper fraction is where we have the numerator being smaller than our denominator. All right, guys? So I'm going to be putting up a number of these um, shapes on the board right now. And you all will have to call me and tell me what fraction is shaded and what fraction is unshaded. This one is the easiest of the lot, and I'm not going to take a call for this one, but you can start calling now because more of these questions will be available for you to answer. How many equal parts is this triangle broken up into? Well, I hope that you can see that it's broken up into two equal parts, all right? So the fraction of a shape that is shaded is 1 over 2, all right? Or as we say, 1 half. All right, half of our triangle is shaded. Notice the triangle here, it's equally divided, right, into two parts. So what fraction of it is shaded? How many parts is it broken up into? Two parts, that gives us our denominator. And how much of it is shaded? Just one part. That's how we're able to say that one half of our shape is shaded, all right? And as for what is not shaded, of course, because it's only broken into two parts, we also have one half of it being unshaded or not shaded. And always remember that that shaded and unshaded portion should equal to one whole, all right? Notice our, our way of, our, of us representing that whole is to have the same numerator as the Denominator. In other words, we have two parts out of two. If we have two parts out of two, we have the whole thing, all right? One part unshaded, one part shaded, all right? So, all right. Guys, take note of our numbers and feel free to call me as we move on to our various other shapes. All right, so I have a caller on the line already. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. <coughs> okay, so I seem to have lost that one. All right, I have here a shape on the screen. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hello, good day. Hi, good day, and who am I speaking with? Sharon Thomas. And welcome to our program. Can you tell me what fraction of this shape is shaded? Quarters. Three quarters, right? First of all, how, how many how many equal parts is it broken down into? Four. Four, right? Yes. And how many of them are shaded? Three. Three. So that's how you get the three quarters, right? Three quarters. And can you just tell me what portion of it is therefore unshaded or not shaded? One quarter. One quarter, right? So we have one quarter unshaded and three quarters shaded, and yeah. how much does that add up to, Cola? Uh, one whole or four over four. One whole or four over four, excellent. Thank you so much for that call. All right. 
So the unshaded part is one quarter. And of course, all together, all right. And yes, we are going to do a lot of these to make sure, or enough of these to make sure that you all get it, all right? Fractions is a very problematic topic for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be, all right? So here I have a rectangle on the screen and I have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi. Hi. Can you tell me what fraction of this shape is shaded? Yes. Okay. It is one third of the fraction is of the shape is shaded. All right. It's broken up into how many equal parts? Three. Into three, right? And who am I speaking with, by the way? Michaela. Uh, welcome, Michaela. So therefore, if we have one third of our shape shaded, what fraction of it is not shaded? Two thirds. Two thirds, because the two thirds would make up the rest of our shape, yes. all right? Three thirds altogether will give us what? Three, a whole or three over three. Which is equal to, in terms of a number, what number is three over three equal to? Three. It's equal to? One. Three. To one, right? The one whole, the two thirds plus the one third is equal to three parts out of three, which is one, right? Yeah. Because we have how many rectangles do we have? All together, this entire shape is one shape, right? One rectangle that has been broken up into. Three. three different parts. So when we add the three parts together, how many rectangles will we have? We'll have three. one complete rectangle. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Or three over three, which is one complete rectangle. All right? So yeah. thank you so much for that call. All right? Well done. So, all right. So we have another shape here on our screen right now that's broken up into equal parts, and I do have a caller to help me with this one. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi, I'm Roshan. Roshan? Yeah. All right, welcome, Roshan. Can you tell me what fraction of this shape is shaded? Yes. Go ahead. Five, three. Five, three? Yeah. All right, try the other way around. Three, five? Right, or three-fifths, right? Okay. Three-fifths. How many, how many pieces is it broken up into? Um, two? No, all right. Yeah. So you told me three-fifths, right, as the fraction. So how many equal parts make up this whole shape? This whole shape, Five, um, Roshan. Five right? Yeah. All right, and remember, we are dealing with... Proper fractions where the numerator must be smaller than the denominator, right? So yeah. we have three pieces of this shape that is shaded. So it is three fifths or three over five, right? Yeah. All right, great. So make sure you don't write five over three for the exam. Eh? Yeah. And can you tell me now what fraction is not shaded? Um, yes, two fifths. Two-fifths. Excellent. Thank you so much for your call. All right. Okay, good. It's good, you know, it's good when, when we make a, a mistake or two in the classroom because it highlights errors that anybody could make. All right? Sometimes it's not that you don't understand. You just, it's a slip of the tongue or you're trying to think very, very quickly. But of course, yes, thinking quickly is important, but you must also make sure that you're, you're being accurate, that you're rechecking your, your work, you're, you're rechecking your steps to ensure that you have the correct answer, right? So the shaded portion of this shape is three-fifths, and the unshaded is two-fifths, all right? And altogether, we'll have five-fifths, which is equal to one, right? And that one is this whole entire shape here. That is the one, people, all right? The one is the entire shape that has been broken up into five equal pieces. That's why it's equal to one when we add it up. All right? Okay, so next shape now on the screen. Do I have a caller? Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hello. Hello, and who am I speaking with? Naomi Mohammed. 
Naomi Mohammed, all right. You have also joined our Ed Model class recently, right? Yes. All right, great, Naomi. Nice to have you on the show. Um, can you tell me what fraction of this shape is shaded, Naomi? Yes. Go ahead. The answer is five, six. Five, six, all right, because this shape is broken up into how many equal parts? Six. Six and five of those are shaded, right? All right, great. And what fraction of it is unshaded or not shaded? One sixth. One sixth. All right, Naomi, thank you so much for your call. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. All right, so that's Naomi there with the correct answer, guys. We have a shape here on the board that's equally broken up or equally divided into six parts. All right, the shaded portion, simply five of those are shaded. We put the five on top. All right, and below, we put the total number of parts that is broken up into, which is six. All right, that's how we know that five-sixths of our shape is shaded, and one-sixth of it is unshaded. All right, so I'm just going to hold up on the course there for a moment. And before we get into the equivalent fractions, which is next on our agenda, I just wanted to say something about naming of our naming of our fractions, all right? So you notice that one of our callers said three fives, all right? Um, you know, it's not, not a knock on him or anything. I just want everyone to understand how we name our fractions, all right? So basically, there are two types of numbers, all right? We have our, we have our, Cardinal numbers, all right, we have our cardinal numbers, and we have our ordinal numbers, all right, ordinal numbers, don't be alarmed, all right, I don't want to, I don't need you to memorize this, I just need you to understand the difference. All right, so our cardinal numbers are the numbers that we use, um, the names of the numbers itself that we count with. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exam for example, all right? And the ordinal numbers has to do with the order of a number in a series or in a list, all right? So what is that? We have first, we have second, we have third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on, right? Those are our ordinal numbers. And for fractions, we will, except for second, right? We don't say um, one second of a shape or of a pizza. We don't have one second of a pie in our hand. We have a half, all right? So the half is an, is an exception. Other than that, well, for first, we ju that is just a whole, right, or one. Great. Then we have thirds, right? Notice where we get the thirds from, from our ordinal numbers, one third. We can also say one fourth or two fourths or three fourths, all right? But we also have an exception here where we can also use quarter, all right? So we have halves and we have quarters and pretty much all the rest use our ordinal numbers. So we have fifths. So we have one fifth, right? We have six, sevenths, eighths, ninths, and so on. So we can have two ninths, right? This here, this fraction here would be read as two ninths, all right? I'll write it in a different color. This here would be read as four elevenths, all right? We have another, this might be, or this is, six sevenths, all right? Notice we are reading the numerators as our cardinal numbers, our regular numbers, and we are reading the denominator as ordinal numbers, all right? Um, a little bit of a nuanced thing there, but of course, that is the proper convention, all right? We don't say six sevenths or four elevenths or four eleven or six seven, all right? It's four elevenths, six sevenths and two ninths and so on 
we have our halves and we have our quarters. The quarters can also be read as fourths, all right? The half is the main exception to that rule. All right, so that's just a little bit, a little tidbit of information there to help you read your fractions properly. If you see it written somewhere and you have to write it in, you know, the numerical form, of course, that will aid you if you understand the difference between our cardinal and our ordinal numbers. All right, folks? So, equivalent fractions now. Moving on, moving one step further. All right? Equivalent fractions are fractions that look different but represent the same amount. All right? Big question marks might be popping off in some people's heads right now. All right? Don't be alarmed. What do we mean by this? All right? We well, before we talk about how we can make fractions equivalent, let's just take a look at some equivalent fractions here. All right? We have four circles here on our screen, and the exact same portion of those circles are shaded in orange. Would you, wouldn't you agree? All right? But the first one, we have it represented as one half, all right? One over two, all right? But our second circle is broken up into four pieces. But two of those pieces is equivalent to one half of our circle, all right? It's the same area of the circle or the same fraction of the circle. It's just that this one has been broken up into four equal pieces instead of two. But if I have two of those pieces or two of those fourths, all right, I have, I have essentially the same amount of circle as the one that is broken up into two, all right? So therefore, one half is equivalent to two quarters, all right? If our circle was broken up into, three pa into six parts, sorry, and I had three of those parts, three of those equal parts, all right, I have the same amount of circle in my possession or the same amount of circle shaded, all right? So one half is also equivalent to three sixths, right? Three sixths, right? A bit of a tongue twister there. And uh, finally, and our example can go on and on by the way, all right? I've broken up the circle now into eight equal pieces, all right? And if I have four of those eight, I essentially have the same amount of circle as I did in our first example, all right? So all of these are equivalent fractions, all right? So what did we say, all right? They look different, but they represent the same amount, all right? And it all has to do with how many equal parts our object is divided into, all right? A certain amount of one would be equivalent to a certain amount of parts with divided in a different manner, all right? So it's divided here just in two, divided in four, in six, and in eight equal parts, all right? And how do I equi equate them, or how do I make them equivalent, all right? Once we have the same portion of that whole, or the same fraction of the whole, it's just represented differently because, it's because it has been broken into more equal parts, all right? So hopefully that brings some clarity to you on why two-fourths, three-sixths, and four-eighths is the same as one-half, all right? So we can make fractions, fractions equivalent by multiplying or dividing the numerator and denominator by the same number, all right? What, what do we mean by that now? Let's take a look. If I multiply the numerator and the denominator of one-half by two, all right, the same number, two, multiplying both the numerator and the denominator, one multiplied by two is two, and two multiplied by two is four, all right? So, the equivalent in quarters of one half is equal to two over four, all right? What if I multiplied the numerator and the denominator by three. I'm gonna get one by three is three, and two by three is six. 
All right, so I've now made the equivalent fraction of a half in six, or six, by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the same number of three. All right, the same number, three. I can also do the same thing for, by multiplying by the number four. All right, so one by four gives me four, and two by four gives me eight. All right, so that's how come one half is equivalent to four eighths. All right, and that is by multiplying. All right, we can even go from two quarters or two fourths to four eighths by multiplying the numerator and the denominator, both of them by two, and I'm going to end up with four over eight. All right. So in multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same number, I'm going to end up with an equivalent fraction with a new denominator and a new numerator. All right, but it's going to represent the same fraction. And if I work backwards and I divided both the numerator and the denominator by two, all right, I'm going to end up with four divided by two, which is two, and eight divided by two, which is four, and I'm going to get that those two quarters, all right? If I divide it by two again, okay, I'm going to end up with one half, all right? Also equivalent. Remember, we said we can make them equivalent by multiplying or dividing the numerator and denominator by the same number, all right? And I could have done it even directly by dividing by four, all right? Numerator and the denominator. Four divided by four being one, and eight divided by four being two, all right? And I'm, yes, I'm laboring this point a little bit because it's something that loses a lot of students, and we don't want it to be lost, all right? Because guess what? On Saturday morning, bright and early, you're going to get a whole bunch of new quizzes to do, and it's going to be based on this week's work, all right? Similarly, we have the 3, 6, right? Dividing by 3, numerator and denominator. 3 divided by 3 is 1, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. And all of these are essentially half, one half, right? Represented as equivalent fractions, all right? One half is actually our fraction in its lowest terms, all right? But we'll speak some more about that later, all right? Later being not today, but in our next program on Monday, God willing, when we do math again, all right? So I have a graphic here with a pizza again broken up into 12 equal slices, all right? So this was another method that I would have used to teach you the equivalent fractions, but since we are running out of time, I might run through this again on Monday, but let's see if any of our callers can help us find the values for the following equivalent fractions, all right? So I have four fractions or four equivalent sets of equivalent fractions on the board, and I want to get our missing numerators and denominators. Remembering that to make them equivalent, we either multiply numerator and denominator by the same number or divide, all right? So I have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Good evening. Good evening, caller. Can you please lower the volume on your television? Good evening. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Kiran Singh. Okay, welcome, Mr. Kiran Singh. Suren. Um, sorry, repeat that? Suren. Suren. All right. Sorry about that, Suren. All right. And, and I, now, I've seen your name Edmodo on the Edmodo. Page. Yes, yes, yes. I did get a notification that Suren Singh has joined us. So thank you for joining. Um, You're welcome. Can you tell me, Suren, one sixth as something over 48 or in 48, right? What is the equivalent fraction of one sixth? And tell me, how did you get that? Yeah. 
Are you there, Saran? Hello? Saran? Hello? Hello? Am I still speaking with Saran? No. Okay, I have a new caller. Good evening, caller. What's your name? Naomi Mohammed. Hi, Naomi. Can you tell me what the equivalent fraction for one sixth is in 48? Yes, the answer is 848. 848. Oh, sorry. Sorry? Can you please repeat that? 8 over 48. How did you get that? Um, 26 times. Yes, I give you 48, I multiply 1 times 6. Excellent. Thank you so much, Naomi. All right, so the key to working this out is whichever two we have given, be it the numerator, the denominator, we need to figure out what was multiplied or what was divided, what number was used to multiply or to divide in order to get the matching numerator or denominator on the opposite side of our equal sign, and we do the same for the missing numerator or denominator, right? Remember, we make them equivalent by multiplying both numerator and denominator by the same number, all right? So six multiplied by eight gives us 48, so we also have to multiply the one by the same eight, which gives us eight over 48 or eight forty-eights. I have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN. Hello. Hi, and who am I speaking with? Hey, welcome back, Micah. All right, so we have two ninths. Can you tell me what is the equivalent nine. for that? Yes. We need to multiply to, to get 12 on the other side. We did 2 times 6, and you get 12, so you do 9 times 6 now, mm -hmm. and you will get 54. 54. Excellent work. So 2 ninths is equal to... 12 over Hello. 54, right? Hello. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Naomi. Let's do the next two on our board. We have 6 over something is equal to 2 fifths. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. And who am I speaking with? Hello, Sanjeev. Hey, welcome, Sanjeev. We haven't heard from you in quite a while. So welcome back to our program. Um, yeah. Can you tell me what fraction is equivalent to two-fifths, right, with a six on the numerator? Okay. Six over ten. Six over ten? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, tell, me, tell me the process here. How do we get from six to two? Because it divided by um, six divided by two. 6 divided by 2 is 2. You sure about that? No. 3 divided by 6 and I get 2. All right. So 6 divided by 3 gives us 2, right? So what number divided by 3 gives me 5? 15. 15. Thank you, Sanji. So that is the correct answer. All right. Thank you so okay. much for your call. So 6 divided by 3 is 2. And 15 divided by 3 is Five, all right, so that's why the equivalent fraction is six fifteenths. Do I have another caller on the line? Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results on IBN TV. Good evening. Hi, and can you tell me our missing numerator for our something over 49 is equal to 1 7th? 7 over 49 is equal to 1 7th. And how did, you know, how did you know that? Because 7 times 7 is 49, so... So I divide it by 7 and I get 7. And 7 multiplied by 1 is 7. All right. So 7. We just did the reverse, right? 7 mm -hmm. multiplied by 7 gives me 49. So 1 multiplied by 7 gives me 7, right? Seven. Or yes. alternatively, you could have said divide, right? 49 yes. divided by 7 gives me 7. seven. And 7 divided by 7 gives me one, One, right? And who was this calling? Michaela. Okay, Michaela. Thank you so much for all your contributions today. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for calling. So, um, dear viewers, 
that's all the time that we have for today. Um, just very quickly, I will remind those of you who joined us um, late that you visit edmodo.com and use the code 6KJQ3Y to register your child as a student. All right, we only have until 11.59 p.m. tomorrow, which is Friday, to complete those quizzes and assignments that were given on Saturday morning. And you can look forward to new quizzes being posted on Saturday morning. And of course, look out for our review, our weekly report on Monday. All right, but before that, don't go anywhere. Um, very shortly, we are going to have the Maghreb Adhan, right? We might, we'll have a short break before the Maghreb Adhan. And after the Maghreb Adhan, we'll be back at approximately 6 or 7 with Ms. Naila, who is going to be giving us all those fantastic creative writing tips um, to improve upon your creative writing skills, which is an essential component of your SEA. All right, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. I have been Sir Ijaz Ramsahai, and thank you for joining me on this mathematics segment, and I look forward to seeing you again on Monday, God willing, at 5 p.m. on Sea Results. All right? Thank you so much for watching.
Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, guys, and thank you for joining me right here with C results on IBN TV 8. And of course, for those of you joining us on our live stream on Facebook, um, those pages that will be C, C results and of course on IBN page as well. Right? So, welcome, one and all. I trust that you all had a great day at school. Uh, coming very close to the end of the first week of school, which means that you're one step closer to SEA, or one week closer, I should say, rather, right? So, you know, you're doing a lot of work. You have lessons in the morning. Probably some of you even have some extra work lunchtime and after school. And then when you get home, you are joining us right here on C results. But don't worry, hard work pays off. So don't let that bother you, uh, you know, too much, right? After this term, you're just going to kick back and relax and await your results. So I'm going to take you through uh, creative writing today. And uh, as you know, we have been talking about the elements of a story. And in talking about the elements of a story, we have already discussed setting. And in setting, we spoke about um, setting being related to time and a place in your story. So you must give the time and you must give a place where your story is happening. And just to note that your setting does not, be, uh, does not need to be limited to one place only, okay? Your setting can vary in your story. And I, show you, I showed you a number of ways in which you can do that. And we also looked at um, the setting or sentences to help you, you know, to describe your setting. Because it's not only about telling us where the story is taking place, but you need to vividly describe what, you know, what we are seeing, what you want your reader to be captivated by. And we spoke and I gave you examples, um, sentences that should be for setting of a city, a town, a road, a village, um, a beach, a desert, um, an island, and a forest, okay, and volcanoes as well. So it was quite a lot. So if you missed that, guys, you can go back on our YouTube channel, see results, you know, and the videos are neatly labeled there for you, so it's very easy for you to find. If not, you can also go on our C results page on Facebook and rewatch those videos as soon as the live has ended, right? Make sure and catch up on all the missing um, episodes. You don't want, you know, to be misfortunate in the sense that, you know, you are getting problems in describing probably a forest because you like to use that type of setting in your story, right? So we give some really useful and handy tips there how you can describe a story. And before that, before setting, we went through figurative language and descriptive language. Now, both of those are essential in your setting description and for what we are going to, do, going to do today, which is character description, right? So you must use your figurative language and all those descriptive words and phrases and so on to help you to enhance your story and to make your story come alive, as well as, you know, for us to uh, clearly see what is happening together with what you want us to see, right? So we're going to jump straight into character description. Now, in a story, it's important, of course, that you have characters. Without um, characters, can you really have a story, right? So a story doesn't need to have two, three, four, even ten characters. Sometimes it might just be one. So it's all about the topic you have chosen and what you are writing. Now, there are different ways in which you can make your story interesting by use of characters. So we are going to look at you know, various ways and, and physical features, you know, to help you discuss and describe your character in a story. So if, you know, for example, um, in your story, you want to talk about how somebody looks, right? But you only, you're accustomed using, well, he's big and tall or short, fat um, or slender or something like that. I'm going to give you some new words and introduce you to new sentences in which you can use, just as we did in the setting of a story, right? So make sure, take some notes. Um, you can even, like I said, go back and rewatch these videos as soon as the live is over. Screenshot whatever you need to, right? The information is there for you. Please utilize it. You don't want to, you know, miss these chances. So when we're talking about character or the characters, those are the people, animals, or creatures in your story. So your character doesn't need to be limited to just people. They can be animals, they can be creatures, monsters, vampires, whatever you want them to be, that, is, that will be your characters in your story, right? Characterization helps characters to come alive. So it's by giving um, your characters and use, through use of figurative language and descriptive language, you're going to make your characters come alive. It also shows the personality of the characters. 
and I'm going to show you how you can even broaden the personality or show the personality of your character through dialogue, right? A writer can tell you directly about a character. So for instance, I can say something specifically about somebody. For example, Jaheem is very competitive. So this is direct. I am telling you about this person. Or a writer can tell you indirectly about a character. For example, two days before the game, Jaheem gathered his teammates and laid out his plan. Now, what does this sentence tell you about the character Jaheem? Doesn't it uh, make you think, well, this person wants to be prepared, right? They're probably competitive and they want to plan out whatever it is very strategically, right? So you can t talk about somebody directly or indirectly. I always prefer to say some things indirectly because I like to build mystery and suspense in my story. And we know in a story as well, um, there's usually a protagonist and an antagonist. Now, what do we mean by these two words or two terms, right? So a protagonist is usually the main character, the hero or the good person, the good guy, the good girl, you know, or, and it has, has the problem that needs to be solved. Whereas your antagonist, the main character's enemy, so the enemy in your story could be a villain or the bad guy or the bad girl, right, which stands in the way of the protagonist solving the problem. I just want to mention here that your antagonist does not always need to be a person, animal, or creature, so on, right? It can be writing about a story that's where you are faced with an illness, and that can be the antagonist in your story. So you need to um, become familiar with these two terms. It's not that you're going to be using these two terms directly in your writing, but you need to know what they mean, right? So when we're talking about characters, there are lots of words, as you can see here. And of course, this is just probably like less than a handful, right? Uh, drop in the bucket of words or adjectives that you can use or even adverbs that you can use to describe your characters. Now, we are not going to limit it only to this table, of course, but these are just some. And from these, we are going to use, make sentences, probably not using all of these words, but I'm going to show you, you know, examples of sentences, you know, another way in which you can probably say that a, a character is shy or very humble, or you want to talk about, you know, how they are, their personality, maybe greedy or adventurous, right? So we don't want to just give the adjectives like this, well, he is funny or she is selfish, right? You want to make your sentences interesting. And this is how we can do so. What I want to do, I'm going to talk about the physical appearance of your character. So you have probably um, a guy in your story and you want to talk about that person. You can either portray that person as a hero or a villain, that's up to you. And however you choose, the words that you choose to describe that person is how we are going to, the reader is going to perceive that person. So for instance, if you want to talk about the age, the height, the shape, probably the texture of the skin, um, the ears, the eyes, all of these things are physical features that you can describe. Now you do not have to take all of this and put it in your story. Remember, you don't want to um, add too much of irrelevant details, but you do want to describe your character and your setting, I will say, vividly, right? You want us to see it clearly, how this person is or what your character is all about, develop a style for them, a personality, and so on. So let's look at these sentences here, uh, which talks about either age, height, and shape of characters. So all of these are sentences you can use if you want to discuss age, height, or shape of your character. He shivered as he looked up at the human pyramid towering over him. Now, shivered, looked up at the human pyramid towering over him. Now what comes to mind immediately? Isn't it um, you're thinking that probably there's a really tall, big, strapped, strapped person in front of you? that's making this person, you know, quip, shiver, right? You're making them scared. So what is in front of you when they say human pyramid, um, they're actually talking about a really huge structure for human. So look at the choice of words here that, you know, rather than just saying, well, he was huge, right? Or he was massive. 
or gigantic, or all of these things, and what we popularly like to say, he was a giant, right? Now, nothing is wrong with that. I'm just trying to show you that there are other ways to say the same thing. That makes your, your story a little more interesting, right? A small man with stumpy little legs shuffled towards them. When you say stumpy little legs, what are you thinking about? Can't you, can't you actually picture somebody really short with um, fat legs or thick legs running towards you, right? So it might be a little funny or comical. That's fine, right? That's what you want in your story. All of this, you know, we welcome in your story. He was big for his age with broad, muscular shoulders. So probably a child who is actually nine years, but he really looks like 15. So here we said he was big for his age. I did not directly give you his age. I did not say, well, he was nine years old and he had broad, muscular shoulders, right? I said he was big for his age. So I am letting you use your imagination there. Next one. The tall, lanky teenager used his long legs to intercept the ball. When we say intercept the ball, uh, what game comes to mind here? What game do you think they're playing? Probably football, right? The tall, lanky teenager used his long legs to intercept the ball, which means to stop the ball. So they're describing probably a player on the field. It tells you that he is tall and lanky, so he's really tall and probably thin, right? And some of them describe him as a lamppost. Same thing with long legs to stop the ball. So you can picture that person running through a field, probably in and out of true players, and stopping that ball. Her huge pot belly hung over her trousers like an enormous skin pouch. So her huge pot belly. What do you think a pot belly looks like, right? Big and round, right? And over her trousers, so over her pants like a normal skin pouch. Which animal do you know holds a pouch in front of them? And yes, it's the kangaroo. So picture somebody, you know, with a really big belly, big and round, right? And um, probably rubbing their belly, patting their belly over their pants. It's laughing over their clothing. So much so that it looks like a pouch that can actually fit something inside there. The gymnast was a short, petite woman. Simple, it's describing what type of woman her, she was. And it probably gives, it gives us here her occupation, right? Um, or not necessarily what she does. It was a short, petite woman. So she was petite maybe because she was a gymnast. She was very well put together, neat and small. Usually what we think about when you're talking about a petite woman. She was slim and dainty and walked gracefully like a ballet dancer. So somebody who is, you know, um, slim, and they practice ballet, you know, they like that ballet, they into that type of dancing or whatever. What type of structure is their body like, really, right? So it's really athletic, you know, and how does a ballet dancer move? Don't they move gracefully? So it's what they're saying here, she was slim and dainty and walked gracefully like a ballet dancer. So she's not necessarily a ballet dancer, but that's just the movement of that person. The fragile boy looked as if a gust of wind would bend him in half. So a lot of um, us used to get this when we were younger, probably growing up, and you were probably a little slim, you know, and your parents might say, well, you know, if a, wind, if a breeze passes, it might blow you down. It's just, it's just um, the sentence is just like that, saying that a gust of wind would bend him in half. So if a hard breeze passes, that they can, easily blown away or fall down or something like that, right? So somebody who is probably really tiny or fragile along those lines. The skin on her arms was loose and flapped like huge fleshy wings, right? So you have your simile here, like huge fleshy wings, the skin on her arms. So picture somebody, um, maybe an old person with sagging skin or even probably somebody who lost a lot of weight and they have all this excess skin. Right, so they're making a comparison here. So her skin on her arms was loose, right? So because it was loose, and probably she was reaching on the top shelf for something, right? And they seen the movement of the skin under the arm, saying it looked like flapping wings. So good, so what we just spoke about was actually the height, age, and shape. So if you're talking about somebody's height, um, age, and shape, these were, you know, some examples here that you can follow. 
If you're writing your essay and you would like to publish, pick out one, that's fine. But don't, don't put in five or six or even three or four sentences to talk about somebody's age. That is uh, not necessary, right? It's unnecessary. You don't need to do that. One piece of information would be fine. And of course, choose the one most appropriate to, for your character and your topic. So let's talk about now the color and texture. Now, when you're talking about color and texture, we're also talking about the face of a person, the face of a character. And all of these so far um, are characters who we are referring to as people, okay? We haven't reached animals or monsters or vampires as yet. All of this are still humans. He was painfully thin and his face deathly pale. So he was so thin that if somebody looked at him, you know, they can feel his pain, right? They're thinking that he's probably ill and they can actually feel, empathize with this person and his face deathly pale. So it's so pale, you know, um, I'm not sure how many of you, I don't know if you would want to, but um, the face of a dead person is really pale, right? The discoloration. So that's what they're talking about here. He was so thin and his skin even looked deathly pale. So maybe that was a really ill person there. His skin was a sickly gray color and hung in wrinkled folds. So probably um, an old person here, again, describing somebody who is obviously sick. His face was crumpled, unshaven, and gray with anxiety. So his face was crumpled. So can you picture the texture of his skin? What do you think his face is looking like, right? And if they say unshaven, that person is probably hairy, right? So they probably didn't have a shave in a long time. Um, I think they're referring to a, a male person here, right? So they have mustache, they have beard, sideburns, probably long, and all of those things. And gray with anxiety, right? So he's going through hard times, I would say. And you can see it on the expression on his face. Her pale skin was translucent. It was almost purple under her eyes and limp and sagging with wrinkles. So her pale skin was translucent, right? So her skin was so pale that you can almost see through it, right? You can see her veins. And sometimes that happens, right? It was almost purple under her eyes. So they're probably talking about the bags under her eyes, right? Under her eyes, right? Not blue. Well, probably close to blue or bluish, purplish color there that you can see and limp with sagging with wrinkles. Limp and sagging with wrinkles. So an old, they're talking about an old person. His face was ashen and twisted with agony. So if I say his face was ashen, what are you thinking about there, right? And twisted with agony, right? So when I say twisted with agony, I'm talking about pain. So he's in so much pain, right? You can actually see that excruciating pain on his face. So, you know, sometimes you're in so much pain or you look at somebody and you can tell that they are in pain, that the face actually looks a little pale, right? They look, it looks different from how they would usually look. That's what they are saying here. Next one. He looked like a walrus with huge, fold, with huge folds of sagging skin drooping from his face. So have you ever seen a walrus before? Right, that animal there, I'm sure you can picture that. And if I'm telling you that that person there, you know, looked like a walrus because of the huge sagging, sagging skin drooping from his face. So if you look at a walrus's face, you'll see the skin all under its neck folded, right? So that's what this person is looking like. He had a sallow, scarred face and a haunted look of someone who had seen many battles. So this person obviously had many trials in life, right? So this is what the person is looking like. Okay, I wouldn't say obviously, but this is what the person appears to be looking like, as if they went through many trials in life. So they didn't tell us if this person is old or if this person is young. But from the description here, I think, you know, that this person looks as though they are suffering with some kind of pain. He had a sallow, so like a sallow is like a... Um, a yellowish, palish, brownish look, right? A uh, scarred face and a haunted look of someone who had seen many battles. So if um, you probably came across somebody who was in the military, right? And, you know, they're telling you stories. Some of them, you know, they have this look on their face. 
um, it's like daunting. They, they can, you can tell from the expression on their face that they have seen many things that, you know, unthinkable then, right? Many unthinkable things. So that is what, it hap what has happened there. And obviously, scarred face suggests that some sort of wounds. His colorless skin was stretched tight over his face and gave him a skull-like appearance. So his colorless skin here, again, talking about pale, right? So the melanin, very low, right? So it's not brown, it's not light brown, it's not dark brown, right? So it's colorless. Moving on. Sharp vertical line borrowed, well, this be lines, sharp vertical lines borrowed between his brows and gave him a permanent frown. Have you ever seen someone who looks as though they have a permanent frown on their face? So this is what they're describing here. If you uh, squint your eyebrows a little bit, like you bend your face like that, you would notice here to the top between your eyebrows, there are some lines, right? So this person here has that all the time. Now, when we get older, we usually have wrinkles, but they're not saying that this person is old. They are saying this is how this person is looking because um, the, the sharp vertical line borrowed between his brows. So right to the middle of your eyebrows, there are some lines there. And that lines, you know, when you frown your face, you usually get those lines. So this, per this person in a, is, looks as though they're in a permanent state of frowning. Moving on. Good. So let's talk about teeth, right? So what can we say about the teeth of your character? Now that will depend on who your character is in your story, whether it's a human or a creature, right? Or it, of course it can be somebody, something make-believe as well. But we are still on humans here. Her teeth were polished pearls, so they were nice and white and bright, okay? Like polished pearls. Have you ever seen a pearl? It doesn't have to be a real pearl, but a pearl necklace, right? Um, how do they look? How do pearls usually look? And they're bright and shiny. So if somebody is smiling at you, sometimes that's the first thing you look at. The first impression is somebody's smile, right? So his teeth were bright and shiny. He had a great sheet of polished white teeth and a warm smile. Again, describing how that person's teeth looks. And of course, it's bright and shiny still. And of course, they have white teeth and a warm smile. That warm smile there is inviting. If somebody looks at you and doesn't smile, do you really feel welcome to go and talk to them? But if somebody looks at you and they're smiling, and that from that smile, how they smile is actually inviting, right? As opposed to somebody, they might smile at you, but the smile they are giving you is like, do not come close to me, do not speak to me. You would know, right? Her false teeth clicked when she moved her lips. So can you hear that, right? Uh, maybe you have a grandmother or a grandparent um, or somebody close to you who has false teeth, right? And can you hear that clicking when they are moving their lips, when they are talking? Can you actually hear that clicking? A gold-capped molar glinted when he opened his mouth. So in Trinidad, we say gold teeth, right? But this is what they're talking about here. Uh, when it said it's a cap, so it's a gold cap, so they're seeing that shine from a distance. Maybe they're standing probably a few feet away, and when that person is smiling because the sun is shining so brightly, maybe, that you can see that reflection there, that probably that shine, right? His teeth jutted out like fangs and curved down his lower lip. Now, when you talk about fangs, which animal here comes to mind? Maybe snakes, right? His teeth jutted out like fangs. So they're talking about the shape of his teeth now. And I'm sure you've come across a few persons, um, you know, whose, whose teeth actually comes out a little bit. Even though their mouth is closed, it comes out a little bit, right? So that is what they're talking about here, jutted out like fangs and curved down his lower lip. So he probably had long teeth as well, right? I uh, just want to make, just remind you guys, um, even if you know somebody like that, and you tend to make fun of them, try not to, okay? We are not encouraging that. This is just a description of a character in your story and strictly for story purposes. His teeth had worn away into yellowing stumps that looked like crumbling tombstones. 
So maybe it's an old person, or even it's a person who likes a lot of candy, right? So the teeth there, right, is worn away into yellowing stumps. Or maybe they are suffering from some sort of gum disease or teeth disease or something like that. And now it's so short, they're talking about stumps, they're talking about the length of your teeth, right? So it's so short that it looks like crumbling tombstones. Behind the thick, fleshy lips, she could see his stained and crooked teeth. So maybe your character smokes, right? And even from, even if their lips were nice and plump, right? And when they smile, or even if, you know, they're talking to you at a distance, you can still see that yellow or brown stain there, right? And probably you can even see shape. So in this case, or direction, I should say rather, it's actually crooked. When he snarled, he revealed two jagged rows of, bro of brown, rotten teeth. So here, this person here gives you a, a slight smirk, right? Or a smile, a crooked smile. And from that, you can, from that one or two seconds, you can see um, he had two jagged rows of brown, rotten teeth. And rotten teeth is pretty visible, right? It's kind of hard to not notice them. What about mouth? If you want to talk about the mouth of your character, you know, what shape they have. Now, you're not only describing um, what somebody, somebody's mouth may look like, but I'm going to show you, you know, how somebody's mouth, open or closed, can give you an indication of how this character, what, sen what expression or what um, sensations they give off, right, from how they keep their mouth, whether it's open or closed. I'm going to explain to you a little better here. She had a tiny rosebud mouth. Now, when we talk about a rosebud mouth, we're talking about lips that are sealed or shut. Your mouth is usually closed here, right? So you might say the baby has um, pink cheeks and a rosebud mouth. So that mouth there is closed like a flower. She had a tiny rosebud mouth. So you can actually picture how that person, person's mouth is shaped. Her mouth and plump lips rose in a perfect curve. Now, what are they saying here? Her mouth and plump lips rose in a perfect curve. This person is actually smiling, rose in a perfect curve. So because of her nice, you know, um, nice lips, plump lips, when she smiles, it forms a perfect curve, right, guys? He was big-lipped and gap-toothed. So... I am not sure if you have seen this before. Big lips, so you can picture really big lips, not just um, thick or plump, but a little bigger than that. And gap tooth, meaning there is a space, um, most likely to the front, right? To the front there, you will see a space between his tooth, or his teeth, I should say rather. Her lips were pale and pressed into a tight, thin line. So here, um, probably somebody who's weak and weary, Right, so their lips here look pale and press into a tight, thin line. So is this person smiling? No, this person is not smiling. Their lips are pursed together in a thin line. Right, so no smile there, they're looking at you straight. Saliva dribbled onto his chin from his limp, drooping lip. So saliva, of course, we know what is saliva, dribbled onto his chin. So you can picture that. Probably um, he was eating, or some persons even salivate when they are speaking, or it just happens naturally, right? Drooping or dribbled, um, dribbled onto his chin from his limp, drooping lip, right? So it's saying that here that his lip was actually a little bit droopy, okay? He had a wide, full mouth that seemed stuck in a sneering smile. So if you say he had a wide, full mouth, so this is somebody who has a really huge smile. When, you, when they smile, you can probably see nearly all of their teeth, okay? So it's a wide, full mouth that seems, that seems stuck in a sneering smile. So that smile that, that smile that he is giving you there is like a mocking smile, right? That sneering sn smile there. Because, he's all, he, because he always has that smile, it looks as though that he is sneering at you. Her lips looked like they had been blown up by a bicycle pump 
and stuck in a permanent pucker. So how many persons do you know like this, right? Or you probably saw this before, right? So their lips look like they have been blown up. So they have pretty big lips, right? Um, a little bigger than usual and stuck in a permanent pucker. So their lips are big and they are also, you know, pucker means to like jut out a little bit, right? They have their lips in a certain shape, in a certain manner. Okay, that's what they are talking about here. And sometimes if somebody's vexed and they're looking at you, they might look at you that way, right? Where they might swell, in Trinidad we say, swell your mouth, right? So it's your lips, you know, you have your lips in a fancy, fancy way. That is not welcoming, of course. She had a wide mouth and thick lips, which curved upwards into a broad, beaming smile. Again, same, similarly here, with a wide mouth, meaning that the smile there is very broad, right? And again, with thick lips, which curved upwards in a broad, beaming smile, except this smile is actually welcoming and quite pleasant. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a short break, guys, and when we come back, we are going to continue talking about character description, and we are gonna move on to the description of the nose of your character. So don't go anywhere, I'll be right back after the short messages. Great news! With Trinidad Fresh, you get 70% real fruit juice, and it's available in Fruit Punch, Orange, and Apple. Drink, drink, drink Trinidad Fresh! with Oasis Premium Purified Water. Now available in more thirst quenching options. 330 ml, 600 ml, 1.5 liter, and 5 liters. Choose the size that fits you best. Grab one today. Let me hear you sing. Got to have my Viva. Water but so much better. Got to have my Viva. Water but so much better. Viva sparkling flavored water. Water but better. Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys, and welcome back to Sea Results. If you're just joining me, uh, we are talking about character description presently. So far, we looked at um, the color and the texture and face of your character, um, some sample type sentences that you can use or follow to help you when you want to describe your character. And uh, we also looked at teeth as well, and mouth, the mouth of your character. So now we are moving on to this, the description of the nose, right? So how can you describe the nose? Um, some of you are thinking, well, why do I need to describe the nose? Well, you can, right? It adds a little more um, interest to your story or to your character. Now, it's not that you have to, but if you would like to add this piece of information, I'm going to show you how to, okay? He had a flattened nose of a boxer. So if it's a flattened nose, you're actually picturing, and we know this from experience, right? How a flattened nose looks like, or what a flat nose looks like. The small, upturned nose was covered in freckles, right? So if it's an upturned, what are you picturing about your character, right? What type of nose are you picturing there, right? A small, upturned nose was covered in freckles. And of course, when we say freckles, um, are we referring to somebody of Trinidadian descent, more than likely, we are not, right? She was a petite woman with a thin, perfectly straight nose. So sometimes you see someone and their nose seems 
perfect, right? It's quite straight and you're like, um, well, maybe not you students, but for the older ones, um, you might say, well, I wish my nose was that straight, right? So she has a perfect nose in other words. Nice and straight. His eagle beak of a nose made him look stern and arrogant. Uh, when you say eagle beak, how does the beak of an eagle usually look? Is it small? Is it neat or tidy, right? His eagle beak of a nose made him look stern and arrogant. So this character does not, you know, um, necessarily mean, or this description here does not necessarily mean that this character is actually stern and arrogant. It makes him look that way. So again, this is um, what we say, judging a book by its cover. So in this case here, his eagle beak of a nose made him look a certain way. Doesn't, need, doesn't mean that this character is actually that way. So that can be a nice turn of events in your story, right? You're judging somebody, saying all these things about this person, and when in fact is actually a nice person, right? Somebody very pleasing. His wide nostrils flared with every breath like an angry bull. So this paints a picture of somebody who is angry. When you're angry or your friend is angry and you're looking at that person, their nostrils sometimes tend to move a certain way or flare a certain way, right? So this also comes with anger. And when we talk about like, a, like an angry bull, the simile here, like an angry bull, um, if you have actually seen an angry bull in action, um, there you can tell how the nostrils of an angry bird, angry bull, sorry, usually moves, you know, when they are charging towards something. His bulbous nose was covered in a swollen red veins, in swollen red veins and had clumps of dark, wiry hair. So if I say a bulbous nose, how many of you use the word bulbous, right? When I talk about a bulbous nose, um, and you may have come across this, some person's nose uh, are actually shaped to the top here, it's actually like a ball, right? So it's not literally a ball, it just looks like a ball to the top here. So your nose is nice and fine all the way down, but when it comes to the top here, it actually is like a small ball, it's round. His bulbous nose was covered in a swollen red, or covered in swollen red veins and had clumps of dark, wiry hair. Picture that, how does that look to you? Right, guys? He looked at them over his glasses, which were perched on the end of his large hook nose. So picture a professor, maybe, right? And if I say a hook nose, so and you can picture the glasses perched somewhere down here, probably eyes bent like this. They're looking over their glasses, and the glasses is hooked right over here because of the shape of their nose, right? She glanced down at him over her narrow, pinched nostrils as if he was a nasty smell under her nose. So this is somebody who is looking at you with scorn, right? Who has scorn in their mind or in their heart. So she glanced down at him over her narrow pinched, pinched nostrils, right? So picture that. If I say pinched nostrils, you know, somebody is looking at you like they're actually, you know, they do not want you near them, right? They're actually scorning you. Um, as if he was a nasty smell under her nose. So he's looking at that person in disgust or probably looking down at this person. And let's talk about hands and fingers. What can we say about the hands and fingers of a person? Her nails were chipped and encrusted with dirt. So um, have you ever been in water so much so that your nails probably went to the beach, right? You spent a lot of time bathing and when you come out, your nails are actually chipped, right? And then you went in the sand and played, and what will happen to your nails? Usually if they are long, sand will go under your nails, or dirt, right? How does it look? Now this can be for somebody, if you're describing somebody, um, probably just came out of the forest or from a dark place, probably was even lost, right? Or even a child who is playing in the park, right? You can say any of those things to describe the nails of that person. Two enormous shovel-like hands lunged at him. So the hands were so big, right? And it actually looked like a shovel. It's not actually a shovel. It looks like a shovel coming directly at him. So probably even, um, probably picture a scary setting with a hole in the wall. Can you picture two hands so big, looks like a shovel. It's going to pick you up, coming towards you. 
right? Doesn't that paint a picture there? Eh? She drummed her long, bony fingers on the table impatiently. So a lot of us like to tap our fingers on the table, right? If I say she drummed her long, bony fingers, can you picture somebody's fingers who are really bony, right? So their fingers are long and they are bony. Picture them tapping on a table. Well, if you say impatiently, then they'll probably tap a little quickly. His hand was a burnt, twisted claw with blackened talons for nails. So this is what this person's hand is looking like probably after some ordeal, right? So twisted claw with blackened talons for nails. When we talk about talons, we're actually talking about or referring to here what is meant by uh, the claws of a bird, right? So how does the claws of a bird usually look, right? Um, they're usually black or dark in color and probably long and a little pointed. So picture somebody's hand like that, their fingernails on their hand looking like that, okay? Her old hands were swollen and covered in lumpy blue veins like rivers on a map. And we see this all the time. We see these blue veins, right? Um, a lot of times in older persons, we can see these old, um, sorry, these blue veins through their pale skin. And here they're talking about somebody who was obviously older. He backed away from the claw-like hand that was grasping at the air in front of him. Again, picture a scenario um, where you put yourself or your character in a situation or setting that is uninviting or scary or something like that, okay? She held out her, ha her bony hand, which felt as cold as a skeleton when Robert shook it. So how does her hand feel, right? Somebody ever shook your hand before and it actually feels like a, um, a skeleton? Is that bony? And because, you know, they're so probably so small, so fragile, um, that they attend, their body tends to be a little colder, right? So the hand is cold here. So picture that cold, bony hand, a lot like a skeleton's, shaking your hand, right? And let's talk a little bit about eyebrows now. What can you say about the eyebrows of a person? Her eyes were curtained by heavy, by heavy black eyebrows. So if I say her eyes were curtained, right, that means that her eyebrows were actually thick, right? So um, not like what we are accustomed to now um, with shaping of eyebrows and trimming and keeping them neat and so on, but somebody's eyebrows who are, who are actually, right, um, thick, right, on top of their eyes. Seems heavy. Her thinly plucked arch eyebrows made her look permanently surprised. So now... Right, so eyebrows probably shape like that, right? It's the shape of some eyebrows. Thinly plucked and arched. Arch meaning that there is a speak or point here. And because of the shape of her eyebrows, it makes her look a certain way. In this case, it makes her look surprised all the time, right? Because you know, if you're somebody um, yell surprised, um, just coincidentally, your eyebrows probably might naturally perk or move into a peak. His bushy eyebrows met in the middle and stuck out fiercely at odd angles. So you can actually um, picture here like birds, right, from Sesame Street, where eyebrows meet in the middle, connecting there, right? And how does the hair on those, on those eyebrows look, right? They tend to be kind of untidy and scrappy, sticking out here, there, and everywhere, right? Or oh, at odd angles, a great way to say that there. He had deep set eyes, which were shadowed by a gnarled brow right so if i say deep set eyes what are you thinking about what is what color comes to your mind there what look comes to your mind can you picture somebody with a deep set eyes looking at you right it's piercing almost which was shadowed by a gnarled brow so this brow here also rough okay it's untidy unkempt and eyes Let's talk a little bit about the eyes of your character. And eyes, um, one of the more popular ones, we can talk about the eyes of any of the creatures we choose to describe, or even people. His eyes were velvet brown and beamed with warmth, like candles in the dark. Very uh, welcoming, and this is somebody who you would want to talk to if they have this look on their face, or the eyes seem a certain way. Eyes that, eyes that were as black as coal, 
hair at all from beneath curly black lashes. So here, some nice black eyes looking at you by some nice curly lashes. So your eyes are, um, I would say beautiful, right? I picture this as beautiful. They're just saying the eyes here are so dark, it's almost black, or it is black actually. And they're also covered by some curly lashes. His steely blue eyes glinted like frost. I don't know how many of us have blue eyes here, but they are very beautiful and do glint like frost. His large staring eyes were an icy gray. Also, similarly with gray eyes, right, tends to look a certain way. His bright green eyes burned with a cruel light. Great, so this could probably be a villain, right? So the eyes are nice and bright, green in color, and the way he's looking at you, you can tell that there's probably some a sense of danger or darkness there. The eyes were an icy blue, cold and dangerous. So that look there, you know, a look of probably disaster, some sort of threat coming, coming your way, right? It's cold and dangerous. You know probably to run. Again, looks can be deceiving, right guys? Just to see. His eyes were is slate gray and bulging like a frog. So have you ever seen eyes before that, you know, um, kind of popping almost, right? So the eyes are pretty close um, out or forward that it looks like a frog, call them bulging eyes. Saddam's mouth was, a set in a was set in a firm line, but his twinkling gray eyes lit up his face. So here, at first, he seems as though he's serious. His mouth was set in a firm line. He's not smiling at you, right? So you're probably a little bit discouraged. But then you look up, and you look at his twinkling gray eyes, and you can see those eyes are warm, right? They light up his entire face, giving him a softer look. Her eyes were mud brown and as big as saucers. Simple enough there. Kitty's eyes were like sparkling blue diamonds and always seemed to dance with laughter. This is a jolly character here, right? From the look on his eyes, you can tell, or her eyes, that this person or this animal or whatever it is you are talking about in your story, you know, it's one that is inviting and warm or even friendly. Okay, guys, so I'm just going to stop there a little bit um, with the description of, your, of characters. We are not finished. Uh, we still have to talk about probably even clothing, probably some wounds or scars um, on the face. We have emotions to talk about. We have still have a lot to do with character description. So next day, which is actually Tuesday for creative writing, we are going to continue with character description. In the meanwhile, I would just like to remind you guys that on, a, on the Edmodo app, um, there are quizzes for you to complete by tomorrow night. Please try and submit all quizzes, right? Math, ELE, and creative writing. And of course, you know, on Saturday morning, we, uh, we try to put up new quizzes for you. So look out for that as well. Be sure to check out our YouTube page, see results. And of course, you can rewatch this video live, sorry, not live, but on our see results page as soon as the live has ended, right? Um, Join us again on uh, Monday. We have mathematics and grammar as we continue with C results, helping you get prepared for that SCA examination. I do hope you have a pleasant weekend, and I look forward to seeing you Monday. It has indeed been my pleasure with you here this afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, guys.